Well, kind of leading up to crucifixion are these trials, right? These uh, examinations of Christ, first by the Jews and then by the Gentiles when he stood trial before both parties. And last week, I asked you to imagine what it might feel like for you to be in a courtroom where everything is nothing but prosecution. There's like no balance. The jury is the prosecution. The judge is the prosecution. The witnesses are the prosecution. And you're just sitting there like a lone defendant knowing that this guilty verdict was reached before the proceedings ever began. This is just an old-fashioned lynch mob masquerading as a kangaroo court at best. If you can imagine that, then you might get a sense of what it was like for Jesus to be on trial before the Jews. But now I want our minds to go a little bit of a different direction this morning. Let's imagine being in a courtroom... And there's really no jury. The judge is the jury. And you're in a courtroom, and all kinds of false charges are being brought against you. People are stepping forward and saying this nasty thing about you and that nasty thing about you. And you are on trial for your life. But the good news is those false charges are seen for what they really are. Just these spurious claims that have no basis whatsoever to them. And after weighing what's said, the judge pronounces you innocent and undeserving of the death penalty. And as you're wiping the sweat from your brow, the judge then turns to you and says, no, I don't want you to take this personally, but we're still going to execute you anyway. As a peacekeeping gesture toward those who want to see you dead. But take heart, because we can tell you've done nothing deserving of this. Because if you can imagine that, then you can imagine what it was like for Jesus to stand trial before the Gentiles. So let's pick our story up in Matthew chapter 27. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. We're going to go to verse 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to him, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. And the governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, Well, then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather than a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and our, on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. 
So the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin, has now finished their examination of Christ. And during the session they held with the Son of God, Jesus confessed to being their Christ, and then Jesus confessed to being way more than they think he is. That from now on they would see him seated at God's side, and they would see him coming in future glory as one ruling from heaven itself. And that sounded really blasphemous to them for Jesus to lift himself up to that kind of level, make himself out to be that divine. And they condemned him as worthy of death on the basis of blasphemy. But they have no political power to put Jesus to death. Right? Carrying out the death penalty, that prerogative belongs to Rome. So it's time to pass Jesus on to Pilate. And Pilate was like a military governor who had been appointed by Rome in AD 26. And normally Pilate would not be headquartered, by the way, in Jerusalem. However, my guess is that Pilate is in Jerusalem because it's this great feast of the Passover and there's swelling crowds in the city and he's probably wanting more of a presence there just as a, as a peacekeeping covering. Now, for them to accuse Jesus of blasphemy will mean nothing to Pilate, right? That's just just matters in your own religious law. You figure it out and don't bother me with these kinds of cases, right? So if they're going to convince Pilate to put Jesus to death, they're going to have to come up with another strategy. They're going to have to make... Jesus out to be an enemy of Roman authority, right? Someone who's in some way a rebel against Rome's rule. And so the leading charge that they bring is that this man claims to be the king. And isn't Caesar the king? And yet this man is claiming to be the king. And they throw some other accusations on top of that, which all sort of support the idea that Jesus is this subversive influence to Rome's authority. Luke tells us what one of those accusations is, you know, like he encourages the people not to pay taxes to Caesar and, and so forth. But the idea is, Pilate, you have a revolutionary here that's on your hands who's a real rival to the state of Rome. The Gospel of John records a conversation between Jesus and Pilate where Jesus clarified to Pilate what kind of king Jesus actually is, that he's not a sword-swinging king with a fighting force down here. He is a truth-telling king who was sent from above. So what I want us to do this morning is to try to step into Pilate's skin and see the situation through Pilate's eyes, to see what Pilate saw on that day and what the scriptures say that Pilate sees. It's important that we remember Jesus was not killed in a corner. He was publicly tried, he was publicly condemned, and he was publicly executed. So what did Pilate see? Well, the first thing that Pilate saw was that he had a very unusual suspect in front of him, the sort of person that he is not used to seeing. Because there is a bold silence in Jesus that Pilate does not know what to do with. Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even a single charge so that the governor was greatly amazed. It's a quiet confidence that cannot be compelled into saying things in his own defense to save his own life. And it says Pilate was greatly amazed, and I don't think Pilate is a man who's easily amazed in that kind of position. What is Pilate used to seeing, guys? 
I mean, what Pilate is used to seeing is fear. Fear and the defendants that are brought before the bar of his judgment. When defendants' lives are on the line and they know Pilate has the power to order the most agonizing of deaths upon them and often does. That's what he's used to seeing. People who are panicking in those moments, who are feverishly rushing to their own defense and denying the accusations or counter-accusing their accusers or giving context to the things that have been said or lying their way out of it or making excuses or begging or crying or promising or pleading for their life. That's what that man is used to seeing. Not this. Not a silent fearlessness that cannot be leveraged in that moment by Pilate to get Jesus to speak. And Pilate doesn't know what to do with that. Jesus stood before Pilate with a rock-solid certainty that there is somebody who is more in charge here than Pilate is in charge here. There is somebody who is more directing things here than Pilate is directing things here. And that this is what obedience to his heavenly father looks like in this moment. I mean, Jesus felt the sentence of death in his own soul, but his hope is in God who raises the dead. And in that hope, he stood quietly confident before Pilate. What's the second thing that Pilate sees? Pilate sees right through what the Sanhedrin is doing. Verse 18, for he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. This has nothing to do with national security or some kind of terrorist threat to Roman occupation or some king, self-proclaimed king who's uh, out to overthrow the political order. That's not what this is about. Pilate sees exactly what this is about. This is a hit job. Out of your jealous hatred for this person, and you're trying to get the governor to do the dirty work that you don't have the legal power to do. He sees right through the situation. And so in that way, what does he see? He sees Jesus's innocence. And adding to his growing conviction about Jesus' innocence is a very mysterious warning sent to him from his wife to do no harm to this righteous man, for she had suffered much in a dream because of him, that Pilate, be very careful here that you do not harm this person. There's way more to this man than you and I even know. So that's the second thing that Pilate sees. This isn't about a true threat. This is just a hit job out of jealous hatred. Hatred, jealousy. So the third thing that Pilate sees is a possible way out of having to make a final judgment here because he doesn't want to have to make a final judgment. And so what Pilate can do is Pilate can make use of a custom at Passover time where as a favor to the Jews, the Romans would release a prisoner of the Jewish nation back to the Jewish people. Kind of akin to a presidential pardon, but not exactly, but it was sort of a way for Rome to ingratiate themselves a little bit with the Jews I'm sure ruling over, I'm sure they were a turbulent people to rule over. So you have to understand that the crowd that has gathered outside Pilate's quarters is way more than just the chief priests and the elders by now. And he wants to give the crowd an opportunity to use. To, to, to receive Jesus back, to choose Jesus and sort of use the crowd through this custom 
to frustrate the Sanhedrin's desires to see Jesus executed. In a sense, set the crowd against the Sanhedrin and kind of hope that the crowd's desire to have Jesus back will drown out the Sanhedrin's voices calling for his execution and sort of overpower them in that moment. And so he's going to make the choice super easy, right? He's going to put two names before them. He's going to put the name of an absolute scoundrel by the name of Barabbas. And you can piece together what the different gospels say about that man. He was a robber. He was a murderer. And ironically, he was the kind of person they were falsely making Jesus out to be, a real revolter against Roman rule. So this is a bad dude. Like This is like, hey, you can have a violent offender and a really dangerous felon, or you can have the Son of God. Who did what? Who fed the hungry? Who preached hope to the poor? Who raised your dead to life? Who healed your sick? Who restored your broken bodies? Who loved your outcasts? Who cleansed your lepers? Who taught you with simple, heart-convicting force with an authority you had never heard or seen before. So what do you want? You want a felon, dangerous felon, or you want that? He's making the choice really, really easy for them. But you know, the chief priests and the elders counter Pilate's move with a move of their own. Verse 20, now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. And so they use their priestly influence over the populace to get them to choose Barabbas instead of Christ. And so they frustrate. (laughs) Pilate was trying to frustrate their desires, but they frustrate Pilate's desires. I want to stop right here because in Barabbas, guys, in this scene, I want you to see our spiritual story because in Barabbas getting his sort of get out of jail for free card, you can see your own spiritual story and a foreshadowing of what the cross is all about. That the guilty offender goes free and the righteous one is condemned. The just for the unjust to bring us back to God. And before God, we are all like Barabbas. We are guilty offenders in the sight of our maker. We have a record of debt that stands against us. And Jesus went to the cross to cancel that record. We all got what Barabbas got in a much greater way on crucifixion day. We got a rich and royal pardon from heaven. We got set free because the Son of God wasn't set free. And it provides a beautiful illustration of what this coming crucifixion is going to be about. And so that brings us to the fourth thing that Pilate sees. And the last thing that Pilate sees is that doing the right thing is going to cost him more than he is wanting to pay. Pilate sees that he cannot avoid having to make a decision about the Son of God. You know, and that's like all of us. We all have to decide, don't we, on the Son of God at some point in our life and what we're going to to do with him. And that's the single biggest decision that we're going to make with our lives, what we decide to do with the Son of God for each of us personally. But Pilate sees, I'm going to have to decide, and I'm in a tight spot here. Because on one hand, Pilate's job is the job of justice, and justice requires that he release this man who has committed no capital offense worthy of the death penalty. That's on one hand. But on the other hand, Pilate also sees that it's not good for his job security. 
if he fails to keep the peace and do what's most pleasing to the crowd here. Does Pilate want another report of another riot working its way back to his superiors? Too many of those, and you might be relieved from your post of duty. And right now, Pilate sees things are boiling over, and they're on the brink of a riot. And he doesn't want that on his hands, and he doesn't want a report of that associated with his name. And he knows the Sanhedrin could spin the story to his superior and say that Pilate was no friend of Caesar's because he failed to deal with an actual rival to Caesar. So what's he going to do? Am I going to do my job? Or am I going to do what's best for my job security? And so Pilate attempts to do the impossible. He tries to do the wrong thing and then claim his own innocence at the same time. Against his own better judgment, he hands Jesus over to the murderous demands of the crowd and then washes his hands as a symbolic gesture of his own innocence. Guys, we are sinners, and in our sinfulness, that is something we're all really good at, doing the wrong thing and then claiming we've done no wrong. And God's not going to let you get away with that. Deliberately do the wrong thing and then say you've done nothing wrong. There is a day of recompense when the books will be opened and that kind of reasoning will be put to everlasting shame. What is Pilate caught in? Pilate is caught in the fear of man in this moment. The Bible says that the fear of man is a snare. It's a temptation trap that causes many to forsake the way of righteousness. The desire to be pleasing to the crowd the desire to never offend anyone over anything, to gain the approval of others, to say that something's right, that you know to be right when everyone around you says it's wrong, to say that something is wrong, that you know to be wrong when everybody around you says it's right, the fear of getting canceled, whatever you want to call it, the fear of man for leads many to forsake the way of righteousness. And this is where a little humility toward Pilate would be good on our part because the fear of man can be a powerful force in the life of a believer. Well, how do you overcome the fear of man? You've got to play the long game. You've got to be playing the long game. Because being people pleasers... Pandering to the crowd, just believing what the crowd wants you to believe, doing what the crowd wants you to do, saying what the crowd wants you to say, thinking the way the crowd wants you to think, that pays immediate rewards. It does. There are quick time benefits you get for living that way. If you know, I'm looking at this, the only person I see in this moment playing the long game is Jesus. And for the joy set before him, He endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus is looking to his reward in heaven, believing that nothing can separate him from the love of the Father. And in that conviction, Jesus stood fearless before Pilate, And resisted all temptation to give in to the fear of man and to say anything to save his own life. His mission was not to save his own life. His mission was to save ours.